We um, now are going to hear from a tag team, uh, Robert Oswald, and he is a professor of molecular medicine at the Cornell School College of Veterinary Medicine, and he's also a faculty fellow in the Atkinson Center for Sustainable Future. He works on the effects of drugs and toxins on the structure and function of the central nervous system proteins. He um, will be sharing the next bit with uh, Michelle Bamberger. Michelle is a veterinarian in private practice here in Ithaca. Um, before she got her veterinary degree, she got a master's degree in pharmacology. And uh, as well as being a practicing vet, she's very involved in education and information. So the two of them are going to share a slot. Um, and their presentation is going to be entitled, Why Animals Make Good Sentinels for Human Health. And I think uh, Robert's going to start off, Michelle's going to do some, and then Robert's going to come back. Hey, good evening. It's a pleasure to speak here tonight. I think this is actually the first time we spoke in Ithaca. We've spoken, you know, all over the East Coast, uh, and I, I really feel that probably this is the most sophisticated audience we've spoken in front of, um, including the CDC. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> It's an editorial comment, maybe. <laughs> uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is some of the work we've been doing, and as a Adam set it up really nicely for us, that uh, it's really kind of a uh, descriptive epidemiology. Um, and so the way we're going to do it, as Ellen said, I'm going to talk first, and then Michelle is going to tell you most of the interesting stuff, and then I'm going to come back and say a few words at the end. So you won't have to listen to me very much. Okay, so anyway, I usually start this way. Since it was used for the first time in the 1940s, hydraulic fracturing of a natural ga gas well has never been proven to contaminate drinking water. We've all heard this, right? But what does it mean? Is it true? It really doesn't matter. Okay, what, what I mean by that is what these people are talking about when they say that is they, they refer to, oh darn, they refer to hydraulic fracturing as just that instant when the uh, rock is fractured. So what we really want to consider, as Adam noted, is the entire process. So in some sense, it really doesn't even matter if that one instance contaminates water, if the rest of the process does. But I'd like to, like to start off by just showing um, this proof of the safety of hydraulic fracturing. It was published by uh, Kevin Fisher, who was a, uh, he was um, CEO of Pinnacle, which was a company that was purchased by Halliburton. Uh, and uh, the authors thank Halliburton for allowing them to publish this. And what they were showing is the, this is the, the depth of the well bore, and all these things that are, these uh, lines that are going up and down here are the extent of the fractures. And this is the Marcellus Shale in various places of New York, not New York, I'm sorry, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, et cetera. And this is the aquifer, and they're showing, oh, look at all this space in between. We're really safe, aren't we? So I got to thinking about this. What about Tompkins County? Well, in Tompkins County, if we're talking about the Marcellus Shale, it's quite a bit different story. It's much, uh, it's much more shallow, and this is about the depth of, of it, down, maybe down in Danby. This is our home in Ulysses, right about here. And you can see uh, that there's a lot of uh, overlap. Right about here is about the depth of uh, Hugo Lake off at Taganic Point, and actually the shale is about right there. So we would actually be fracking into the lake if uh, the fractures act actually went that far, and they were fracturing under the lake. So we can't be certain that hydraulic fracturing in our area would not contaminate wells. In fact, what I've heard people say when I've said this is that, well, nobody will frack at 2,000 feet. Well, I would say I think some of us have been here when Jessica Ernst was here a few months ago, and that's exactly what they did to her. So this is, uh, I think, a real concern. Anyway, so just to go over, what we're, what we're really concerned with is not just that. We're concerned with all parts of the process, drilling, the fracturing itself, trucking, um, 
This could have been a bit better picture. I actually took that photograph while I was driving, so you know I shouldn't say that. <laughs> uh, some impoundments, condensate tanks, pipelines, which are everywhere in Pennsylvania. And I think one of the most important things we have to realize is that these wells are going to be with us for decades. And this is a picture, this is actually a picture taken by the DEC in one of their publications showing an abandoned well and what sort of shape it's in. And this is a publication by Ron Bishop that just came out in our special edition of New Solutions that was just published last month. And uh, what he shows is that there are quite a few, in, this is the inactive well inventory for the DEC and this is the number that have been, that have been plugged. So we have a lot of abandoned wells in New York State that have not been plugged. And if, if a fracture hits those abandoned wells, that's a contact with the surface and the aquifer. Okay. So, I will now turn it over to Michelle, who will describe our studies. So I'd like to just take a few seconds just uh, to thank this guy who was just speaking up here, who happens to be my husband too, uh, for joining me three years ago. I started off uh, doing this then, and I think he felt a little bit sorry for me uh, when he realized I wasn't as good on the computer as he was in looking up data that we needed to, to find. I'll be talking about that in a minute. So. Uh, Thank you, Robert. Uh, um, okay, so again, we started doing this three years ago, not only to uh, determine not, was, not what was happening uh, to the animals, but also what might be happening to us. Uh, we realized pretty quickly that animals are great sentinels, especially livestock, because they're on site uh, pretty constantly they have a higher exposure rate. If you add to that their higher rate of breeding and shorter generation times, you can see how we will start to see health impacts in animals much sooner than in people. And as we continue to document cases, and we are continuing to document, what we are finding is that it's the children in families that are usually the first to become sick. And um, that is because children have higher metabolic rates than adults. They take in more food per pound of body weight. They breathe more uh, than we do. And their uh, systems, their body systems, especially their drug metabolizing systems, are not as mature as ours. So they are more sensitive to toxins. OK, so one, one thing I'd like to make uh, uh, clear, Adam did talk about different studies. Our study is often confused with uh, giving uh, an idea of prevalence. So uh, prevalence is how, how common are drilling-related problems, health problems, going to be? We get asked that all the time. Our study does not give any idea of prevalence. Uh, it's a case study, as Adam was, was mentioning. Uh, that's, the prevalence is not going to be answered by our study. Our study does also not answer the question of cause and effect that Adam uh, was talking about earlier. But what we can do is document what happened and we can come up with exposure rates from that. We can also document uh, drilling events and contamination events. And um, I think what's important is when we start thinking about historical use of case studies, that case studies are a great way to begin to study changes in health, especially if we think back to AIDS and HIV. Those were initially case reports that started showing up and pointed people on to the studies that Adam was referring to, the epidemiological studies, and then onward to the cause and effect so that we could find out what was happening. Okay, so for our research that we did, we interviewed owners of both companion animals and food production animals and basically went after three broad categories of information. The first was drilling information and that's where I was referring to uh, help from Robert. Um, we really went after as much information as we could get. We got information from the people, then we went on the state environmental regulatory agency sites for more information. But what we were looking for were location of drill, uh, gas wells, uh, injection wells, impoundments, processing stations, uh, all that sort of uh, uh, information. We also went after dates, 
dates of drilling and fracturing for each well within a certain mile uh, radius of, the, of each uh, case participant. The next category of information that we uh, accumulated were environmental test results, air, water, and soil, both pre-drill, post-drill, and in between. And then the last category was health records. We started off with just animals, but quickly realized that the owners were oftentimes sick too, and sometimes with the very th same thing as their animals. I'll be talking about that in a minute. So we got those health records. What I asked for was at least five years before drilling started. Um, we put all that information together and we have a timeline. And from that timeline, then we drew our exposures. So this is a, a chart uh, showing uh, how we grouped our exposures that we had in our study into those four main phases of drilling, hydraulic fracturing, wastewater, and uh, processing and production. Um, in our study, many of the cases had multiple exposures. So they, had a, they might have drilling, they might have wastewater, so there were multiple exposures. Um, three, approximately three quarters of our cases fell in the well water quality or quantity change either with drilling and or hydraulic fracturing. So that was, a, that was where the most cases fell. That was the biggest exposure. Approximately one third of the cases fell under the wastewater exposures and another third fell under processing and production. So this was the case that first uh, piqued my energy. Now it's for uh, um, interest. Uh, four years ago, uh, uh, this occurred in Louisiana. Uh, 17 previously healthy cows died within an hour after exposure to hydraulic fracturing fluid. So the thing to remember here is that it's one hour, and this is hydraulic fracturing fluid that is 99% water and sand, and a beef cow is uh, on the order of 1,000 pounds or more sometimes, large animals. And again, uh, the big thing that's important is that one hour. If you do a literature search, you'll find a lot of papers referring to animals, especially cattle and livestock, that succumb in one to three days after exposure to petroleum compounds. So what's again unusual here is that one hour time frame. Um, there were petroleum compounds found in the small intestine of the cow that was necropsied, uh, but the lesions in the trachea, lung, liver, and kidneys were indicative of the presence of toxicants. And uh, quaternary ammonium compounds were found in the fracturing fluid in addition to other compounds, but the tetramethyl ammonium uh, compound, which is a quat, is extremely toxic and could have produced those symptoms uh, that we saw with this uh, uh, necropsy, as well as the lesions that were found uh, in this case. Let me see if I can go ahead. Okay, so uh, farmers don't always keep all their beef cattle uh, on one pasture. Uh, they oftentimes keep them on different pastures. So we were lucky to have several cases uh, where an exposure occurred and the herd was split on different pastures. In the first case, it was a beef cattle herd that was on two different pastures. Uh, in one of the pastures, um, there was a wastewater exposure. According to the farmers, the liner was allegedly, uh, they, they say it was slit, uh, and it went, ran down off the slope of the impoundment uh, and down into the pasture where the cows were. And that part of the herd, uh, this farmer experienced uh, death in uh, uh, several of his cows in the period of the one to three days that I mentioned earlier, the reproductive problems that he saw uh, were stunted in stillborn calves. Uh, in the other pasture where the cows were not exposed to the wastewater, there was no change in health. With the second herd, um, this farmer had a larger herd and he had them on three different pastures. There was one pasture that ran along a creek where a wastewater was allegedly and reportedly being dumped. It was found later that it was dumped in, on the creek, in the creek uh, uh, at the time that this farmer experienced these problems. Uh, this farmer experienced uh, the same thing, acute death in one to three days. Uh, his reproductive problems with his cattle were a little bit different. His cows didn't breed back. A large percentage of them did not breed back. Uh, the other two parts of his herd on different pastures had no change in health. 
Uh, the last one is interesting because unlike these two, these were surface, these were wastewater. Uh, this was a casing failure. So this was a dairy herd in the, in the farm, in the barn, um, with uh, exposed to affected well water. Uh, and uh, this fellow with his herd experienced a number of different problems, uh, including reproductive problems. He had part of his livestock outside uh, and um, their source of water was a pond and their health has not been affected. Okay, so if we think uh, back to that timeline that I talked about earlier in exposures and how I asked for health records before drilling started, what we did was we compared uh, something as simple as health changes before and after, and what we got um, was in the, the large, large number of food animals and companion animals fell under reproductive problems, and they were a combination, one or more, of the failure to breed, abortion, stillbirths, and failure to cycle. And the owners, for the most part, um, uh, encountered a constellation of symptoms that we're calling, for lack of a better term, shale gas syndrome. And they had burning eyes, nose and throat, severe headaches, nosebleeds, rashes, and GI symptoms that were typically vomiting or diarrhea. Okay, so Adam uh, has already mentioned some of these things. I'll just review them quickly because Robert will again talk about some more of these things. We had hoped when we started this study to come up with something more definitive than what I've already told you. But we feel that um, we couldn't because of these issues. And I want to also say that these are the same issues. In fact, my list is going longer with questions and data gaps that I had three years ago. Uh, so the identity of chemical additives, uh, Adam mentioned frac focus. The industry all, always touts this as, well, here's your list of chemicals that we used. Well, what, what more do you want? Well, there are a couple things wrong with a frac focus. Uh, number one is it's voluntary. So if a company doesn't want to give any information, they don't have to. The second thing is proprietary chemicals are not listed, as Adam mentioned. And the third thing is that the chemicals are listed after completion. So that makes testing uh, really hard because you don't know what you're testing for. Okay, so the MCLs, maximum contaminant uh, levels, uh, that's basically our national uh, primary drinking water standard we're talking about here. Uh, we don't know what the MCLs are of most of these chemicals that are used in uh, fracturing uh, and muds, as well as what comes back up from the shale. Um, this hit home to me recently, actually last week. We have several of our cases that are involved in the EPA study that's ongoing that Adam was talking about. And so I have been privileged to review results, water results from those studies. And I was shocked when I looked at the column for MCLs, and I found that there were greater than 75% of these analytes that the EPA is, is looking into in water do not have MCLs, greater than 75%. Um, we cannot really make good predictions accurately on health effects without MCLs. Okay, um, complete pre and post drilling testing is missing often, especially um, pre-testing in general. A lot of people uh, don't have that, they can't afford that. Uh, sometimes the companies, will, the companies will do it, I guess in some states if, if they're within a certain distance, if the people are within a certain distance of the well pad. But it's, it's often, I've never seen it done completely, and I don't even know what completely would actually be because we don't know exactly what's, what's in uh, the mix. Um, uh, long term, uh, the health effects that I've mentioned are pretty much short term, especially with the humans, but also with the animals. Uh, these are short term effects. We have no idea what the long term effects will be. Um, low dose effects, I think Adam mentioned this and Robert's going to talk about it a little bit more. When we talk about endocrine disruptors, they act at very, very, very low doses. We have no idea what the health effects at low doses are going to be. Uh, the microbes is something that people don't often bring up, but there are microbes in the shale down there that come up. The companies add, ba add bactericide to kill them, um, but we want to know more about that because as the companies tell us they're going to be using greener solutions, they might be cutting back on the bacteria size. So how will the microbes affect our health? And the last uh, list, uh, thing listed on here is non-disclosure agreements. They cut us out of definitive uh, health information. 
Okay, so this is the topic that we get asked about the most. People want to know how safe is your food going to be if it comes here, or how safe is it from these areas that are being intensively drilled. And I think the important take home from our study is that even though only one herd was quarantined, all of the herds were exposed to affected air, water, and soil. Um, the other thing uh, is that this is a great concern to us because we documented cases uh, from farms in areas with known exposures that are still producing food products without testing of the plants, animals, or the products. So this brings up two questions that I'll leave you with. Um, the first is, how safe are these food products from the farms where known exposures have occurred as well as farms downstream and downwind? Um, and how safe is the rendered flesh from exposed cattle, realizing that uh, the cow may die and it may not make it to your plate as a piece of steak, but the rendered flesh will go on to become feed for chickens and pigs, so the toxic can, toxins can still work their way into the food supply. Uh, the answer is we don't know uh, uh, the, the answer to these questions for three main reasons. The first is that there is inadequate federal funding of, of food safety research specifically related to chemical contamination in this country, just, just not being looked at. Um, uh, the second thing is there's no monitoring being done. I think Adam mentioned that too as, a, as a necessary in, in several studies. There is no monitoring being done in intensively drilled areas pre or post harvest or pre or post slaughter. And the third thing is that there are very, very few experimentally determined hold times amongst this list of chemicals that we're referring to. Now a hold time is the amount of time that an animal is held back from slaughter once it's exposed to a chemical. So if we put all this together, uh, my basic conclusion uh, from my study is that the public health right now is at risk without knowledge of filling in all those data gaps we talked about, without more study, uh, and without really understanding what's happening. Thank you. OK, so um, the point we're making is we really have to understand the human and animal health impacts, and we really need to base it on science. And I think as Adam showed, we don't really have the science yet. I think he very eloquently pointed that out. But one thing that I want to get to is where does a burden of proof lie for, for showing whether, um, you know, there is a health impact that's associated with drilling? Um, this br brings up the precautionary principle, and I think Adam very wisely stayed away from that word. Um, it's, a, it's a really difficult concept because most people, when they use it, don't really think very much about what they're, what they're saying about it. I, it's really a, a very complex topic. And, and in public health, it's almost a cliche now to talk about sort of the founder of the, or what people think of the founder as, of the precautionary principle, John Snow, that took the pump handle off the, the uh, a well in, um, in London in 1854. But actually, that was really something, I think, very different. It was really the beginning of epidemiology and, and mapping cases to, you know, to different areas. He and William Farr really founded epidemiology. They studied where the cholera cases were in, in London. They mapped them out. And, they, and from that, they kind of figured out that maybe, you know, it was coming from this well here. And, and there was actually, next to the well, there was uh, contaminated sewage. And John, John Snow took it to the uh, equivalent of the town board and uh, proposed to take the handle off. So he actually went through the, the process. And then he took the handle off, the cholera epidemic abated. Uh, so, Really, what he did was very similar to what we're what we're thinking about here. They're looking at actually John Snow's part of it was to go around and do case studies. He went around and talked to I think about 50 families and discussed you know got their health records. So so he did a case study before that, and then he used risk analysis, essentially a crude form of risk analysis, to decide that it was probably more important to take that pump handle off 
than it was to figure out where the micro, what the microbe was and try to you know, uh, follow the chain of contamination and prove that it came from the water. Okay? So this is somewhere in between the precautionary principle and the way we do business in this country. There's something about uh, you know, looking at the data and making an educated view of the risk involved. And I think we really need to, to, to think about this in more detail. Uh, we're really no stranger to this in this country. I mean, if we think about how drugs are approved. Adam talk, talked a little bit about uh, clinical trials for drugs. Well, where does the burden of proof lie when a pharmaceutical company wants to bring a drug to market? They don't say, oh, let's just, we think this drug's pretty good, let's bring it to market, and then, uh, and then require all the patients to prove that it's unsafe. They have to prove that it's unsafe before they bring it to market. And I think it's very little to ask that this, the, uh, the process of gas drilling follow somewhat the same model. Okay, Mich Michelle mentioned non-disclosure agreements. Uh, these are things that really have caused uh, some problems in, in, our, in our studies and studies uh, that others have done. And that is that uh, you know, people have been forced to sign agreements that they can't talk about the problems they've had. Um, Steph Holowich's case, fortunately, was just recently unsealed. Uh, she was the person on, on the picture uh, uh, in the flyer for this, uh, this symposium. So that, that was actually a great victory, but there are many, many other non-disclosure agreements that we don't even know about. In fact, uh, in some cases, non-disclosure agreements, even the existence of the non-disclosure agreement can't be disclosed. So there, there are quite a, quite a lot of uh, problems. And what we need to do is really think about this as well. If we go back to the pharmaceutical analogy, can you imagine that uh, if a drug company uh, has a drug out on the market and then people start having heart attacks who, who uh, take the drug and dying, and what if the drug company just paid their families off and said, let's not talk about this. And they just went around and, and did that, and then they were able to continue to sell the drug and make profits. All these people who signed non-disclosure agreements, they've been paid off. My guess is that there might be some prosecutions of the people in those drug companies, but that's exactly what's happening here. So we have to get rid of non-disclosure agreements in cases where public health is at risk. Okay, so we've talked a lot about testing. Um, testing has not been done adequately in most cases. We've looked at so many cases in Pennsylvania. They say they have pre-drilling testing. They say they do testing when there's some contamination. But we've also seen cases where the DEP, frankly, has withheld information from people because they didn't think, well, they didn't think it was very relevant to them, even though it arguably was. Uh, we believe that testing should include everything that's used in the drilling process, as well as those things that we have some idea of what's coming up from the shale. Um, we think the drillers should obviously release the names of all the chemicals with the CAS numbers. That's called the Chemical Abstract Service. Uh, and we really need to know about these before drilling occurs so that we can do testing. But we all, always hear, I mean, we, we've, Adam has mentioned and Michelle has mentioned frac, the Frac Focus website that's always touted by industry. That information only gets put up on the web after the well is completed. That information is completely useless for pre-drilling testing. And we know that testing needs to be done in a much wider area. We've seen there's there've been contamination at least 3,000 feet and perhaps a, uh, a mile in terms of water away from drill sites. So we need to expand the area that we're doing pre-drilling testing. 
Okay, um, then how do we interpret the results once we get them? We've, Michelle mentioned maximum contaminant levels. Okay, so this is a level of a, of a compound in water, the maximum level, that it, where it's considered safe to drink. But as she mentioned, there are very few substances used in drilling that actually have scientifically determined MCL levels. So if a compound does not have an, a, a, a legal MCL level or secondary MCL level, then you but nevertheless that compound is in your water, your water is still considered safe to drink. We've seen that many times. Okay, the other, there, there are two other things that I wanna say about this. The other thing we don't know is what is the effect of more than one chemical? These chemicals were tested one at a time. If you have benzene and toluene in your water, should we correspondingly drop the value of the MCL to, to take in, that into account? That's something that's not done and little is known about that. Uh, and finally, uh, we know that some compounds, the endocrine disruptors in particular, work at extremely low concentrations. In fact, they sometimes, they're sometimes more potent at low concentrations than at high concentrations. MCL levels are only the most toxic levels. They're things that happen at high, they're, they're levels that are set at high concentration. Low dose effects are never taken into consideration. But in terms of long-term health effects, these are, these are crucial. Okay. In New York, we've circumvented a lot of these problems. We have MCL levels for everything. How do we get them? Well, frankly, we've made them up. That's how they've done most of the chemicals. So, so if you look at the S guys, you'll see lists and lists of MCL levels. They have no scientific basis. They're just set to a value. So this is a concern as well. Okay. All right, so we've been concerned also where, the, where does the wastewater go? We've talked a lot about this. We've seen, uh, we've seen illegal dumping. Uh, this is a good example of this. Oh, nope, let me go back to this. This, is, this was actually dumped on a road. Uh, we watched the truck do it. Uh, one thing I can't show you here is uh, because you can't have a slide that has smell with it. Uh, if you were able to smell what that smell smelled like, you, you would be disgusted. It, it was really terrible. And actually, this flowed right into a pond where there were some ducks. Uh, this was um, on a road in Pennsylvania. Uh, so this is actually, in some cases, legal to do this. This obviously was not legal. This was some really pretty nasty stuff that they were dumping on the roads. But in, in Pennsylvania, they are allowed to use wastewater from fracking operations to de-ice and more recently to, to uh, spread on roads to, to, to keep down dust. Now, I've, we've always wondered why they, tr they need to keep down dust in the middle of a rainstorm, but they do that too. So, so, so uh, it's called beneficial use. Um, I think George Orwell came up with that. Uh, name. Okay. So anyway, in order to use it for spreading uh, on, on roads, and we still may be faced with this in New York because this is part of the s guys. there has to be some testing of the fluid, but it's only one test at one point in the cycle, well cycle. So, and it's only a very minimal set of, of compounds. In fact, New York, uh, in the s guys, it says that benzene will not be in the wastewater, yet that's the only organic they test for before they have, uh, they, 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 they propose to allow wastewater to be used on our roads. Okay, so what else? Um, injection wells, we know a lot about those. They've, uh, they are some, sometimes thought of as a really great way of getting rid of wastewater. Um, the problem is that in a number of cases they've caused earthquakes. Most recently, uh, something as large as a 5.7 uh, 
uh, magnitude earthquake um, in, in Prague, Oklahoma, just not too long ago. Um, it was also, uh, this has also happened in New York, Avoca, New York in 2001. There was an injection well there was a, where there was an earthquake of almost magnitude of four because of that. So this is actually, when, we pe when people talk about fracking ca causing earthquakes, this is actually where that, that comes from. And finally, let me mention recycling. Recycling is used um, more and more in Pennsylvania. It's actually not such a bad idea. They don't have to get rid of the wastewater, but every time they use it, it gets more toxic. So in the end, it's a much more difficult thing to dispose of. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of negative things tonight. And Adam ended his talk by pointing out, um, you know, maybe possible to move forward and get away from fossil fuels. And he was talking about it in, in, in a global way, in, in, in New York State. We can, you know, this, the state can, can, can do some very important things to move us away from fossil fuels. But what I want to end with tonight is that really each of us can do things in our own lives to move away from fossil fuels. Um, in our house, we've, we've actually dropped our ener energy use by about 60%. This is one way we've done it here, which is putting solar panels on our house. This is actually amazingly affording, affordable. Um, there are many, many ways of doing that beyond just um, buying the panels. There, there are ways of um, financing them so they're, they're, or leasing them so they're not any more expensive than the electricity that you buy. There's also a program now, Solarized Tompkins, that's active in, in, in Danby, Caroline, and Dryden, and I'm hope, hoping soon in Ulysses, where we can use massive buying power to, to decrease the cost of solar energy. But solar energy has gotten more and more affordable over the years, and uh, it's actually something that I think very, could be very realistic for a lot of people. Even in our sort of um, climate that sometimes is a bit gray and sometimes we have snow on the panels, but nevertheless, with this, with this array here, which is 18 uh, 240-watt um, solar panels, it offsets all of our electrical use. So it's possible. The other thing that's really possible for people to do that can make a difference is to get an energy audit. And NYSERDA offers energy audits that are free or very, very low cost. We had one done uh, by Snug Planet. You can find a lot of really low-hanging fruit uh, to change in your house to get uh, much better energy efficiency. And one of the things that I find most uh, most useful is this. It's not. It's actually not a laser pointer, pointer, but it's a uh, it's a thermometer. You could point it at it at the screen and tell what temperature it is. Uh, but this is really extremely useful around your house because you can go around and find out where the cold air is coming in, and it's it can be as inexpensive as moving a piece of insulation around to to uh, improve the efficiency of your house. So I think everybody can do something now to change our energy use and convert our society from one that's dependent on fossil fuels to one that mo is moving toward renewable energy. And one more statement. Uh, one of the things that we've always said is that we feel that this gas drilling uh, boom that's sweeping the world, and it, it is indeed the world. I mean, we, we know that it's, ha you know, it's happening Australia, Ireland, South Africa, Poland, Bulgaria, et cetera, et cetera. Sweeping the world, and we're exporting it, but really what it is nothing more than an uncontrolled health experiment. And we are really the laboratory mice in this health experiment. Thank you. <laughs>